2 Chronicles chapter 31 When all this had ended, the Israelites who were there went to the towns of Judah, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. They destroyed the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and in Ephraim and Manasseh. After they had destroyed them all, the Israelites returned to their own towns and to their own property. Hezekiah assigned the priests and Levites to divisions, each of them according to their duties as priests or Levites, to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, to minister, to give thanks and to sing praises at the gates of the Lord's dwelling. The king contributed from his own possessions for the morning and evening burnt offerings and for the burnt offerings on the Sabbaths at the new moons and at the appointed festivals as written in the law of the Lord. He ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and Levites so that they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, olive oil and honey, and all that the fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds and flocks, and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them in heaps. They began doing this in the third month, and finished in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed his people Israel. Hezekiah asked the priests and Levites about the heaps, and Azariah the chief priest from the family of Zadok answered, Since the people began to bring their contributions to the temple of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare, because the Lord has blessed his people, and this great amount is left over. Hezekiah gave orders to prepare storerooms in the temple of the Lord, and this was done. Then they faithfully brought in the contributions, tithes, and dedicated gifts. Conaniah, a Levite, was the overseer in charge of these things, and his brother Shimei was next in rank. Jehiel, Azaziah, Nahath, Azahel, Jerimoth, Josabad, Eliel, Ishmachiah, Mahath, and Benaiah were assistants of Conaniah, and Shimei his brother. All these served by appointment of King Hezekiah and Azariah, the official in charge of the temple of God. Kore, son of Imna the Levite, keeper of the East Gate, was in charge of the free will offerings given to God, distributing the contributions made to the Lord and also the consecrated gifts. Eden, Maniamin, Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shechaniah assisted him faithfully in the towns of the priests, distributing to their fellow priests according to their divisions, old and young alike. In addition, they distributed to the males three years old or more, whose names were in the genealogical records, all who would enter the temple of the Lord to perform the daily duties of their various tasks according to their responsibilities and their divisions. And they distributed to the priests enrolled by their families in the genealogical records, and likewise to the Levites twenty years old or more, according to their responsibilities and their divisions. They included all the little ones, the wives and the sons and daughters of the whole community listed in these genealogical records, for they were faithful in consecrating themselves. As for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who lived on the farmlands around their towns or in any other towns, Men were designated by name to distribute portions to every male among them and to all who were recorded in the genealogies of the Levites. This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. 2 Chronicles chapter 32 After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come, and that he intended to wage war against Jerusalem, 
He consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. They gathered a large group of people who blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then he worked hard, repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He built another wall outside that one and reinforced the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square of the city gate and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Later, when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah, king of Judah, and for all the people of Judah who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? When Hezekiah says, The Lord our God will save us from the hand of the king of Assyria, he is misleading you to let you die of hunger and thirst. Did not Hezekiah himself remove this God's high places and altars, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, You must worship before one altar and burn sacrifices on it? Do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? Now do not let Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. Do not believe him. For no god of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my predecessors. How much less will your god deliver you from my hand? Sennacherib's officers spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. The king also wrote letters ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him. Just as the gods of the peoples of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the god of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. Then they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall, to terrify them and make them afraid in order to capture the city. They spoke about the god of Jerusalem as they did about the gods of the other peoples of the world, the work of human hands. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel, who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem, from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. He took care of them on every side. Many brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and valuable gifts for Hezekiah, king of Judah. From then on, he was highly regarded by all the nations. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord, who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond to the kindness shown to him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him, and on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had very great wealth and honor, and he made treasuries for his silver and gold and for his precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of valuables. He also made buildings to store the harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil. And he made stalls for various kinds of cattle and pens for the flocks. 
he built villages and acquired great numbers of flocks and herds, for God had given him very great riches. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he undertook. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. The other events of Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Hezekiah rested with his ancestors and was buried on the hill where the tombs of David's descendants are. All Judah and the people of Jerusalem honored him when he died, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. Acts chapter 23 Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem so you must also testify in Rome. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than forty men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petitioned the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than forty of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of two hundred soldiers, seventy horsemen, and two hundred spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. 
provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Silesia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Psalm 7 Lord, my God, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me, or they will tear me apart like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Lord, my God, if I have done this and there is guilt on my hands, if I have repaid my ally with evil or without cause have robbed my foe, then let my enemy pursue and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and make me sleep in the dust. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree justice. Let the assembled peoples gather around you while you sit enthroned over them on high. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness according to my integrity, O Most High. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure, you the righteous God who probes minds and hearts. My shield is God Most High, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. He has prepared his deadly weapons. He makes ready his flaming arrows. Whoever is pregnant with evil conceives trouble and gives birth to disillusionment. Whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. The trouble they cause recoils on them. Their violence comes down on their own heads. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. Proverbs chapter 2 My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose way of life is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. 
Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, for men whose words are perverse, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. Surely her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the unfaithful will be torn from it.